Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are continuing our coverage of HFES 2018. I am sitting here with Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. My name is Nick Rome, and I'm also joined today by Mr. Keith Fawcett, who is a Coast Guard civilian marine casualty investigator. We're going to be talking to Keith today about his presentation on the sinking of the El Faro, uh, which, Keith, I got to say, that was that was a heavy presentation, and I think this is, uh, is going to be a heavy discussion. <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, tragic loss, uh, one of the worst maritime uh, disasters in U.S. history uh, since February of 1983 when the Marine Electric sank off the coast of Virginia. Yeah, so uh, just to recap, so I, I want to kind of get into the background of the El Faro and just to kind of catch people up to speed if they're not familiar with this accident. So the El Faro was a uh, merchant ship that ran into a tropical storm and kind of had a lot of different factors that contributed to uh, the sinking of the ship, right? Yeah, it was a U.S. flag uh, container ship that was on a regular run from Jacksonville to San Juan. And some of the factors that we examined in this two-year investigation were fatigue, communications, uh, design elements, uh, commercial pressure on the shipping operation. It was a routine, what they call liner service. They're trying to get cargo on a regular schedule, uh, despite the weather, to San Juan, Puerto Rico. So uh, it was a tragic loss, and 33 people were killed, which is the entire crew. That included 28 Americans and five Polish nationals. Yeah, I don't even know where to start with this one. I took so many notes to kind of prompt me for questions. I guess let's just kind of start, start with the captain's role in all this was kind of, at least in, in my mind, critical to what happened. Obviously, there's a lot of different factors that contributed to this, but it kind of seemed to me like the buck stopped with the captain. And if you have a captain that, for better or for worse, is in charge of this whole operation um, and they're not listening to the different instrumentation devices to their crew, to any of the other environmental factors that are going on. It, it feels to me like that is probably the biggest con contribution to this whole thing. I don't know if you can uh, elaborate on that a little bit, but that to me is kind of one of the things that I took away from it. Well, you have to remember that the accident occurred in 2015. The uh, Coast Guard uh, masters, which are captains of ships, are given the ultimate authority for the safety of their vessel. And the company that operated the ship said that the captain was certificated by the U.S. Coast Guard. He was the ultimate authority to handle the hurricane. Um, we live in the year 2015 at the time of the accident, and there's a huge variety of tools that can help the captain, including something that wasn't used called weather routing where shoreside weather experts look at the weather, look at the ship's course and speed and so forth, and make suggestions to the captain on how he can steer the safest course around the hurricane. This right. ship was not provided with that. Can I ask, you mentioned certified to be a captain by the Coast Guard. Can you go into a little bit of what kind of um, vetting that, that process has for somebody who eventually will be a captain? So, so the captain of the El Faro was what they call masters of any tonnage, any waters. The captain can command any ship flying the American flag in the merchant marine, a cruise ship, a tanker, a car carrier. So it takes uh, either going to a merchant marine academy, such as he went to Maine Maritime Academy, and then once you graduate from there at the end of it's a regular college, a maritime college, you get a third mate's license. And then you have to accumulate sea time and experience, and then you sit for second mate, then you sit for chief mate. Chief mate is the second in command of the ship and ultimately the masters. So it is a long uh, climb to go from, even with a right. service academy background, to master. Now, in the old days, a lot of people went through that in what they called the hawse pipe. They were able-bodied seamen, and they just worked very hard without a formal education to become a master. 
So the captain of this vessel went through a long uh, program where he was uh, given extensive examinations by the Coast Guard. And ultimately, he was certificated to operate the El Faro or any ship in the U.S. merchant fleet. Hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a lot of stuff that goes into, a lot of experience that goes into being a captain. And I, I want to get away from the captain because that's my own personal bias and I'm not like trying to, you know, flavor anybody's opinion on it. You mentioned a variety of different factors when it comes to uh, the sinking of this ship that pertain directly to human factors, such as training, fatigue, even uh, altered states of consciousness with the -the over-the-counter drugs, um, team management. There's, the list goes on and on. Uh, Was there any factor that you found particularly critical or was it a combination of all these things into one sort of I don't want to use the analogy uh, one sort of perfect storm <laughs> it, it, it is a good analogy there were there were so many factors uh, that played a role in this accident um, we examined all of these factors and found that as the ship was proceeding Uh, down towards the storm, one of the major factors is they had a plan. It was to pass 65 miles from the eye of the storm. They they failed to realize uh, that that was never going to happen. All of these warning indicators where the mate said we're going to be 20 miles and then the mate said we're going to turn right into the storm should have been indicators that the plan was not successful. Nonetheless, the ship proceeded at full speed and maintain full speed to make an end run around the storm until the engine was lost just before 6 o'clock in the morning on the morning it sank. So kind of one of the things that I really took from your talk this morning is on paper, a lot of things seemed like they were fine. Like they, all the crew was correctly certified. The ship itself had been audited by other parties and by the company itself to make sure that it was seaworthy and all that kind of stuff. But when you started going through the actual factors that led to how the ship actually sank with some of the design flaws in the build, and like you talked about the scuttle itself, like maybe not operating the way that it should, is do you think there's a need to bring in more regulations to help make sure that even though on paper right now things may seem like they're all right, but are they actually... Is this actually something that can be put out to sea, or would that have had any impact here? Well, the results of the Coast Guard investigation were that we formulated 31 safety recommendations continued, uh, contained in the report of investigations, and there is a bill moving through Congress and the Senate now that's making significant progress, which uh, addresses a vast majority of those, uh, for example, more inspections, more thorough inspections, uh, more review of the plans of complicated ships to make sure that those plans of the ships are, uh, will ensure the safety of the ships and their crew. So there's an extensive legislation in it that's moving through Congress right now that will address a significant majority of those uh, safety recommendations. The uh, NTSB also had other recommendations uh, that uh, were separate from the Coast Guard but they enhanced the kind of uh, proactive safety measures we advocate. You mentioned the NTSB. They did a completely separate sort of analysis of this event, right? That's correct. They, they worked with us. Uh, they were initially the lead when we got to Jacksonville when the accident began to unfold. We gathered uh, mountains of evidence together. And then at one point, upon the completion of the hearings, which occurred uh, the third set of hearings, we went our separate ways to conduct analysis, reach our conclusions, and formulate our safety uh, recommendations. So that there is a divergence between us and the NTSB uh, to a small degree on, on the facts that we analyzed and the conclusions we reached. Sure. And and I'm just trying to figure out like what the delta between those are. And um, I, I, before we started the show, you gave me some really good resources on the Alfaro, and I'm I'm trying to figure out what the deltas between these two separate investigations were. Um, are can you speak to any of those? Well, the one of the things the NTSB uh, we we both found a similar possibility that 
uh, and on the transcript, there was a recording of all the voice communications on the bridge. And at one point towards the end of the ship before it sank, someone made a comment about cars being loose, floating in the holes. And later on, there was a, a reference to the cars are subs, meaning they've sunk. But there was some piping down below that was a large diameter pipe, which was part of the emergency fire main system. And in the NTSB's report, for example, they surmise that a vehicle might have struck that pipe, sheared it off, and flood water from that sheared off pipe came through the hull and exasperated the flooding uh, in the hold and, and caused the ship, uh, one of the reasons the sink, ship sank as swiftly as it did. However, we mention it in our report, but we don't analyze and conclude that that was quite the event that the NTSB does. Okay. So it's things like that that we can kind it's of... Subtle, it's subtle. Right, right, right. So I guess just looking at all these different factors, I we can jump into these one by one um, unless you have one that you're particularly interested or you, Keith, um, that you want to jump in. Is there any, any one of these human factors, these topics that you feel like... Um, passionate about that you want to let others know about because one of the things that you said at this at this talk was that there are so many easily preventable things um and and you mentioned the bill going through congress right now that will hopefully address a lot of these things um is there anything that we can speak to that is uh can we talk about those easily preventable things because those are the well, one, one of the things I brought up was uh, the concept of bridge resource management. And the, the captain of the ship uh, tended to deal with ship's officers on a one-on-one -on -one basis. He would deal with you when you were on watch and you when you were on watch. The problem was the plan wasn't communicated uh, throughout the ship's officers who made the decisions. And br bridge resource management, like aircraft cockpit resource management, is a team concept. You would expect for a ship going into a hurricane, the captain to draw the bridge officers and the engineers together and say to the engineers, is there any problem with the ship running at full speed going around the, heli uh, around the hurricane given the fact it's 40 years old? And you would expect them to say, hey, we're good to go. No problems, captain. And then the navigation officers, that he would detail the plan to them and they would voice their concerns and then when it was all said and done, the captain would take those concerns and then talk to the team and say, this is how we're going to do it. And from the outset, the plan was made for this storm to go 65 miles from a hurricane. And I have not found maritime experts that will validate that decision and say that was a good decision. Um, the terms I've heard used are in the 100 mile, 150 mile. And that, one of the factors was the vulnerabilities of the voyage plan where the Bahama Islands were just to the right side of the ship. They could see them go by on radar with shallow water. Didn't allow the ship an escape. So I know we're running a little tight on time here. So I guess before we end this, I want to talk to you kind of about a lot of our listeners are kind of junior in their career. Would you say what you do is forensics? Yeah, it, it is forensics, and uh, it, is, uh, it, it is very uh, challenging but rewarding as you dig through the volume of information to find out what happened. Um, we approach this unbiased. Um, we try not to have an opinion in the beginning. We're fair. Uh, we respect seafarers, uh, the people that go to sea, and we don't make judgments. We assemble the facts and do that. So, yeah, it is forensics, and it, it, it is a very worthwhile uh, experience and very rewarding. So for someone who may, may have heard your talk and, and is now interested in this field that they may not have known about, what's one sort of piece of advice that you wish you had when you were going into the field? I, I've often found that it's strange. We go into this being unbiased. But what goes on behind the curtain in an accident is far worse than we can ever imagine. And as we dig and sift through the facts and we find 
the facts. But we don't necessarily get all of the information that's out there. And then later on, we may meet somebody from the accident in a place such as this, and they say, did you know that? Fill in the blank, whatever it is. And you're astonished what you didn't find. So it's perseverance, it's uh, dogged determination, and it's uh, approaching it unbiased and, and digging to uncover the truth in what actually happened. Keith, this, this has been amazing. I Honestly, some of those quotes from, that, from your presentation were just heartbreaking to read some of the emails that were sent um, prior to the accident. And uh, honestly, just thank you so much for taking the time to do this. If our listeners want to follow along um, with your work or the work of the Coast Guard, where can they find uh, any resources? Well, the Coast Guard publishes uh, a... Uh, site on the internet called Maritime Commons, which is the news source for everything related to uh, uh, maritime affairs. We also have a Coast Guard investigations website uh, that's on uh, the Coast Guard's uh, homepage. And it has information about all the major investigations. It has the sailing ship Bounty, the El Faro, uh, a host of other investigations, uh, and also the NTSB has a docket where they have these reports like uh, the El Faro report and a host of other evidence. You can actually pour through the evidence yourself and figure out what went wrong. So if you, if you could brush up and get your own practice. Oh, well, yeah, that's the way like a listener could go in and try and figure out like how you came to some of the conclusions you did maybe. Well, all the information's there, and you can look at it, and you can conduct your own analysis and see if we might have been correct. <laughs> awesome. Well, Keith, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about this. Uh, again, we really appreciate it. The way we like to sign off the show is we say it depends because it does depend on the human based on whatever it is, right? So I'll count us down. On three, we'll say it depends. Ready? One, two, three. It, it depends. depends.